Well, what shall I say about our next speaker? Dr. Tom Malone was saved 47 years ago this past, uh, 57, wouldn't it be, Tom? 57 years ago, Wednesday this week. And he's one of the few men that was born again and born to preach at the same time. He was called to preach the very split second he was saved. That's an unusual story. He said God saved him 57 years ago on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, the 12th of August, called to preach the same day. And preach he has. I mean, I heard him first in 1961 the conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Now we'll forget his sermon. He preached on deacons from Acts chapter 6. And when he finished, I said, I, I wonder if I've ever seen a deacon. <laughs> if I did, I don't remember ever seeing one. Not according to what he said a deacon's supposed to be. And I wondered if I knew anybody that would qualify to be one when he got through preaching. But what a sermon. I still remember that so well. It was in that conference when God <clears throat> changed my own life. Since then, his sermons have been featured in the sword of the Lord, well received. We're now doing a, book of, uh, a series of books by Dr. Malone. If you don't have them, you ought to get them as fast as they come out. One volume is Dr. Tom Malone Preaches on Bible Certainties. Another is Dr. Tom Malone Preaches on the Church. Another is Dr. Tom Malone Preaches on the Apostles. And as fast as we get the manuscript, of course, we have to print books when we're not publishing the sword. We can't publish the books as fast as we'd like to, but we're trying to get them out as fast as we can. And uh, I don't know how many volumes he plans to have in this, but I hope you'll have 15, 20 volumes at least or more, make a complete set of books, already three are available, you ought to get all three of them over there. Tom Malone, Dr. John R. Rice told me one day, um, maybe the America's greatest pulpiteer preacher, and that's quite a statement coming from Dr. John R. Rice, and what respect Dr. Rice had for Dr. Malone, he's been a friend of mine, a friend of the sword, and a friend of uh, Dr. Rice during his lifetime, and he's your friend. And you'll hear him gladly, Dr. Tom Malone. Well, the first thing everybody says is I'm happy to be here. That's always the first thing. I've often wondered how many of them were lying when they said that. But I want to tell you I really mean it this morning. I'm happy to be here because at my age, I'm happy to be anywhere in the world. And I'm just happy to be here. I, I'm glad I got to celebrate my spiritual birthday. 57 years ago, 12th day of August, 12 o'clock noon, in a little country church. That was on a Wednesday then. And it was Wednesday of this week, 7th day of August. The Lord changed my life and called me to preach. And when I got up from the old-fashioned mourner's bench, I knew just as sure what God wanted me to do as I am right now. And I thank God for the privilege of being here and having fellowship with you dear folks. Uh, I'm 76 years of age. I have a reason for telling you that. I heard, now I don't know whether this is true or not, you know, you nearly everything you hear is not true. But uh, I heard that some time ago Dr. Lee Robinson said to an audience, uh, guess how old I am. And uh, Dr. Robinson's a little bit older than I am, but I don't know exactly how old he is. But some guy sitting down on the front seat said, you're 90. And, of course, he's not, in, he's not near 90. Dr. Robinson said, I'll never again, as long as I live, ask folks, <laughs> guess how, how old I am. And uh, I just won't tell you, I'm 76 years of age. And uh, I have a reason for telling you that. I, I want you to pray for me. I believe God's given me a new vision and new strength and new help to do some things until he takes me home. And even when the Lord gets ready to take me home, I'm going to give the Lord a 113-point outline on why he ought to wait just a little while longer because, <laughs> you know, I'm not all that big a hurry to go to heaven. I'm, it's just like heaven on earth to me to be saved and preaching the word of God. Some folks say, well, I'm homesick for heaven. Well, I'm going to heaven. I'm just as sure of heaven as if I were already there. But I'm not all that anxious to go today. I've seen too many of those holes in the ground, too many broken hearts and tear-stained faces. So I, I want the Lord to leave me here a while longer. 
course, when he gets ready, it's all right with me. It doesn't make a bit of difference in the world. But I have some things I want to do. There are three things on my heart I want God, if he will, to let me do before I leave this earth. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm going to let you just wonder about that. Think about it. But I do want you to pray for me. I believe God's given me new strength, new help, new vision to get some things done while I'm yet in this world. So I'm glad to be here in this conference. It's been my privilege to be in a lot of uh, Sword of the Lord conferences for many years. And I'm glad to be here with you, dear folks. I love Dr. Hudson very much. Thank God for him. And I'm not saying that just to try to impress him. I don't have to impress him. Uh, I, I mean it with all my heart. Pray for him every day. And I stand where he stands. And I thank God for him and for the sword of the Lord and the impact that paper has had on the world for more than 50 years. And I thank God for these conference, conferences. Uh, there's not anything held in America any greater than the sword of the Lord conference. Oh, I know there, there's a moody week and all that sort of thing in conferences, but I won't tell you for a life-changing experience and for getting right down uh, where people live and what people ought to do, the people of God. There's nothing like the sword of the Lord conferences. So I thank God for them and uh, for the little part the Lord's let me have. It's my honor, my privilege to be here with you dear folks today. I'm glad I'm preaching first. I always ask Dr. Hudson. He and I preach together several times during the year. And I ask him, I beg him, always put me on first because he knows how to close out. I know how to just stir up trouble and get the confusion going. But he knows how to take care of all of it and wind it up at the end, make it come out right. So I'm glad I'm on first for a number of reasons. I was preaching the other night, I just got home from Pennsylvania there just a few hours before I came here. Um, I was preaching the other night, and it wasn't in Pennsylvania, and I'm not going to tell you where it was, but they had 13 special numbers just before I preached. Did you hear what I said? 13. I didn't say 12. I said 13 special numbers. And the preacher nudged me and said, Now, Brother Tom, take all the time you want. And it's nearly 9 o'clock then. So I just did what he said. I took all the time I wanted. So I'm, I'm glad to be on first. I'm not going to take all the time I wanted. If I did, this would be all we'd do today until lunchtime. But I'm glad to be here. And I, I want you to turn your Bibles this morning with me to the book of Jeremiah. And let me see. I might have lost my text. I don't know. Uh, chapter 49. Jeremiah chapter 49. I mark my Bible where my outline is. I can, I can find the text, but if I don't find my outline, I'm in an awful lot of trouble. So I, I mark my Bible where my outline is. But the chapter is the 49th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Now, I, I say this with, seriously this morning. I want you to think about what I'm reading. I know you do when we read out of the Word of God. But I want you to think seriously about what I'm reading this morning. The scripture I'm going to read to you has some names in it. They're even hard to pronounce, and it sounds a lot of, like a lot of things you may not be all that interested in. But I believe there's a message here that God's laid upon my heart this morning. That's all I know to preach, is what the Holy Spirit of God puts upon my heart. I, I don't know to do anything else. I can't do anything else. So I want you to help me by paying close attention to what we're reading. There's six chapters here in the book of Jeremiah, one of which I'm reading from now. But there's six chapters that deal with God's judgment upon Israel's enemies, chapter 46 through chapter 51. All of them mention people in the past and history who've been enemies to the people of God. And what God's going to do to them, the judgment of God upon the enemies of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And you know, some of it's already come to pass. In fact, what I'm going to read this morning has already come to pass. And I've had the privilege to be, and it didn't make me any better, and I hope it didn't make me any worse, but I've had the privilege to be 
at the city of Petra a number of times, which is an Edomite city, where they hewed out a beautiful city in the rocks and said, we've got it made and nothing's going to ever bother us and no one can ever destroy us. Well, no one lives there today. Haven't lived there for a long time because the judgment of God came. You know, I can't help but mention before I read that when I read about the judgment of God upon these nations, I say, oh, Lord, how long will it be? Not so long, I think, until the judgment of God comes upon America. I want you to remember this morning, God's taken this nation, lifted it up in his hands and weighed it, and God knows what's going on in America. And I believe the judgment of God is coming. I'm not a pessimist. I, I'm an optimist, and I'm happy. And I praise God for the privilege to live in this hour of history. But I believe the judgment of God looms over our nation. I want to read, starting verse 7, concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will visit him. If grape gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? If thieves by night, they will destroy until they have enough. But I've made Esau bare. I've uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled in his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Leave thy fatherless children. I will preserve them alive. And let thy widows trust in me. God's not talking to the Edomites here. I'll mention that in a moment. But God said, I'll take care of your children and leave them alive. And let thy widows trust in me. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. For I've sworn by myself, saith the Lord. Oh, I underscored that statement in my Bible. I've sworn by myself. Don't you ever forget what God has sworn by himself. It's going to come to pass. Already has what I'm reading. That Bosworth shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse. And all the cities thereof shall be perpetual wastes. I've heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather ye together, and come against her. Rise up to the battle. For lo, for lo, I will make thee small among the heathen, and despised among men. Thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, uh, that holdest the height of the hill, Though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I'll bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. And Edom shall be a desolation. Every one that goeth by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. As far as I'll read, I want you to look at verse 8 with me. This morning, and I'm looking at two, two words in the Bible. I believe they're the voice of God speaking to God's people this morning. In verse 8, God says, Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him the time that I will visit him. I want you to just maybe, if you would, just underscore two words in verse 8. Dwell deep, God said. Dwell deep. Now, I want you to notice to whom the Lord is speaking. Makes all the difference in the world. This scripture describes the judgment of God upon some people that were enemies and opposed God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. But there were some people in the land of Edom where the descendants of Esau lived who were not citizens of the country. They were called the Dedanites. 
If you'll study about the D-Danites in the Bible, you'll find they, they were merchants. That's what they were. Isaiah called them traveling companies. They were not citizens of Esau, uh, of Edom. They were traveling companies. They were merchants. They were just there going up and down the country, uh, trafficking in merchandise. God said to them, I don't have anything against you. I'm going to destroy this, this nation of Edom. But you're not a citizen of Edism, Edom. You're a sojourner here. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to dwell deep. I want you to find you a place in some rocky cave or in the depths of the woods and find you a secret hiding place. I don't have any score to settle with you. You're not a citizen of the land. You're a sojourner here. And when the judgment comes, if you're dwelling deep, it'll be all right with you. You know, I was reading this passage of Scripture one morning in my home, and I believe these two words, dwell deep, leaped out at me. You know, th this I, I'm just like the D-Danites. Uh, this world's not my home. You know, I'm just passing through. I'm just going up and down in the land, and I know in a sense I'm a citizen of America, but I have a citizenship this morning, thank God, that supersedes all other uh, relations I have to this world. My citizenship is in heaven from whence I look for the Savior at whose appearing I'm going to be changed, have a new body. Uh, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through for a while, I, and I'm like a merchant too. I have something for the people that I'm here just to give it to the people, the message of the gospel. And when the judgment comes, I'm going to be hid with Christ in God because this world's not my home. You know, I believe this morning this is a picture of a Christian people. I was reading recently about Abraham in the chapter of faith, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. I saw something startled me. Like I had a, heard a fellow say one time, it knocked my hat in the creek. I've read it hundreds of times, I guess, but I'd never seen it before. It said, Abraham sojourned in the land. Now you think about it. God gave the land of Canaan to Abraham. God made a covenant. God said, Abraham, this is your land and your seed, and nothing in the world can ever change the covenant of God. Abraham said, uh, this is my land. I know God gave it to me, but look the way the Bible speaks. Uh, uh, Abraham sojourned in the land. That's not a citizen. And notice it says, as in a strange land, that's where you are. You're in a strange land this morning. You're not home yet. Hallelujah, we're not home yet. It's going to be all right when we get home. Praise the Lord. He sojourned. He just went up and down in the land God gave him. He never felt at home in it. He said, Bible said, he sojourned in the land as a stranger. And I like what it says, dwelling in tabernacles, same word as for tents. Abraham never built a house. Abraham said, not going to be here that long. Abraham lived a long time, 175 years, I think. But he said, I won't be here long enough to build a house. I'm going home. And the Bible says, he looketh for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's what I'm looking for this morning. That's what I'm looking for. This world's not my home. This, I'm just like the D-Danites. And God said to them, dwell deep, dwell deep. I, that's what, I believe God has a message out of these words. Oh, you know, you look in the Old Testament and you see names that are hard to pronounce. And Dr. B.R. Lakin said when he read something in the Bible he couldn't pronounce, he just figured it's a misprint or he could have pronounced it. But uh, names of places hard to pronounce. And way back in the Old Testament and dealing with nations don't even exist anymore. And you say, what, what does that have to do with me? I want to tell you, God has a message on every page of this Bible for your heart and for mine this morning. I know the Bible wasn't all addressed to me. I'm not Israel. And uh, scores of times God spake unto Israel, saying, but I want to tell you something. 
This Bible tells me this Bible is for me. Whatsoever things are written aforetime, written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. This is my Bible. And when God speaks in this word, God's talking to Tom Malone. God's speaking to my heart. God's dealing with my soul. And I believe this morning, God has a message. Dwell deep, he said. I believe that's what Christian people ought to do. You know, there are a lot of folks uh, about to back up. I don't think God wants a Christian to ever do that. Oh, listen, sometimes when the way gets hard and it gets rough and your footsteps totter, uh, you're prone to say, well, I've about had enough of this. Oh, listen, what you need to do is to go out that day and uh, relive that day when the Lord Jesus took upon himself a cross and walk the Via Dolorosa out toward the hill of Calvary and stumble beneath the cross and his footsteps struggled. But Jesus never quit. Jesus got up. Somebody helped him. Got that cross on his back and the purpose of the ages hung upon whether he'd get up and go on or not. And thank God he did. And when, when your footsteps struggle, Get up and go on and dwell a little deeper, and God will take care of you. Oh, listen, people all over the country, I hear people complaining. Sometimes they're preachers say, well, you know, they're hammering on me. They're hammering on me. They're talking about me. So what? That's, that's standard equipment. You don't have to order that. You don't have to say, put that on a car. That's on every car. That's standard equipment. Uh, when they're hammering on you, I'll tell you what you ought to do. You ought to go out and stand by the hill of Calvary and listen to the clanging hammers nail the hands of Christ to the cross. And you'll, you'll never have it like that. And go on and on and dwell deeper. I like what the book of Hebrews says. Let us go on. Don't stop here. What we need this morning, I believe, is what I've needed at periods in my life. We need a new vision and a new power and a a new strength to do the will of God, no matter what the cost is. Dwell deep, God says. An old preacher years ago prayed this prayer. I think if I'd heard it before I'd studied this, this uh, phrase and this chapter, I wouldn't have known exactly what he meant. But he said, Lord, help us to deeper sink, that we may higher rise. I like that. You know, the deeper you go in God, the higher you're going to rise. The Bible says Judah took root downward and bore fruit upward. You know, most of the preaching today is about the public image, how it ought to be in the pulpit, how you ought to act as a Sunday school teacher, and how as a bus driver and as a leader and a member of the choir and all that. But I want to tell you, God's book deals with your life behind the door. That's the most important thing about our life this morning how you live at home, how you live when there's nobody there but you, how you live with yourself, how you spend time with God, how you seek the secret place and get along with God until God touches your life and gives you power and victory. Dwell deep, God said. Now, I'm, I don't know much about homiletics. I've taught it several times, but I still didn't know anything about it. Didn't learn anything even about my own teaching. But I, 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 that this, this verse causes me to think about several things. I believe this morning we need to go deeper in the Bible. Oh, you say, preacher, uh, we, we love the Bible, we believe the Bible, and uh, we have a Bible. Yeah, I know that. So have I. I and say the same things. So God impresses my heart this morning. We need to go deeper in the Bible. I'm not talking about what some of these theologians say. Brethren, let's get down to the deep things of God. I'm talking about what Paul was talking about when he said, I have not seen, neither hath the ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love them, that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for it is the Spirit that searcheth all things. You know what God is saying? God is saying, you can take the teacher who wrote this book 
the Holy Ghost of God and go deeper in the Bible every day of your life. This is not just a Bible. This is my Bible. And it's the sweetest book I've ever owned. Oh, God pity the Christian that doesn't take time every day to eat the manna from heaven and to get along with the book of God and dwell deep in this blessed book. What a sweet book it is. You know, I read the 119th Psalm. In fact, I read it once. I've read it many times. But one time I was reading it, and I said, I believe I'll preach on I preached on 22 weeks. Um, yeah, I was about the only one there when I got through. But uh, I like that Psalm. I like that Psalm. The psalmist said, uh, Thy word is sweet unto my taste. It is like honey in my mouth. You know what he's saying? He said, Oh, I like that. That tastes good. I like that. It's sweet under my taste. Maybe it's not to you this morning. I don't know. I know you believe it. But maybe it's not sweet and like honey in your mouth. But I want to tell you, when you sin as a Christian against God, that's the sweetest book in the world. Because you can come to the Bible and read if, you, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but I like that verse. I use it every day. Yea, every hour. I say, oh, Lord, cleanse me from the sins of the flesh and my failures and shortcomings. And it's sweet when I look at that verse and no God said it, and it's as unchangeable and immutable as God himself. Oh, it's a sweet book. It's sweet to those who've sinned. It is sweet to those who need comfort. And oh, everybody needs that. Everybody needs comfort. You do, I do, everybody does. I like what the Lord said in Isaiah chapter 3. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Couldn't say anything greater than that. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. God knows how tall you are. He's not going to let it overrun your mouth. He said when you pass through the rivers, I will, it will not overflow thee. And through the fire, it shall not burn thee. Neither kindle a flame upon thee. I like that. I like that. Because I want to tell you, for every Christian, and please, for God's sake and your sake, remember this, for every Christian, there are deep valleys and there are rivers to cross and mountains to climb. And sometimes you're going to need to look back at the book of God and say, this is what God said would happen when these times came to me. Oh, yes, yeah, a sweet book when you need comfort. It's a sweet book when your mind's in trouble. You know, I read in the 119th Psalm, God said, I'll give, uh, through this uh, book, I'll give understanding to the simple. Said, Lord, that's me. Thank God for that. You know, I'm glad the Lord loves simple folks and can talk to simple folks. I wish a lot of these preachers would remember that. They put the hay so high in the rack that the little lambs can't even reach it. But God said, I'll give understanding to the simple folk through this blessed book. Sometimes old mind gets so confused. Well, Dr. Jack, I was preaching not too awfully long ago, and I was preaching at the same, same time and sitting in the audience while he's preaching. He got on this thing about it. He said, now, I'm not going to be here this much longer. It, I thought he'd going to die in a minute. He said, I, I won't be here forever. And he said, uh, you better remember, I'm not going to be here to warn you. And I was sitting out there, and he said, and Dr. Malone has lost his mind. And he went on preaching like he thought he just made a profound statement. And that may be true. My old mind gets confused sometimes. But I'll tell you, I, I know where to go to get it unconfused. I know one hallelujah that can straighten it out. Dwell deep in the Bible. That's what God is talking about. You know, it's the sweet book to those who are weak. And listen, don't, don't try to kid God and kid yourself. There are weak people here in this church this morning that need the strength of God. Say, oh, well, I've been to the altar, and, and I believe the Bible, and I've prayed for power. I know all that. But I want to tell you, 
Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And I'm not a student of the ancient languages very much. I had 130 hours of Greek. Nobody here has had that many hours, I'm sure. Because it took 130 hours to graduate from Bob Jones College. Everything I took was Greek to me. I've had more Greek than anybody in the world. But the, that verse means it keeps on pouring strength into me. He just keeps on. Listen, thank God. He's the all-powerful one. His strength never runs out. God never said, well, I'm too weak to help you today. See me tomorrow. Oh, no. Not the God I know and the God you know. And, and there, this is a sweet book for those who are weak. Oh, how sweet it is to those who are brokenhearted. Every day my phone rings or the mail brings a message from some brokenhearted soul. I've had my own broken. I know what it means to weep before God on the face with a broken heart. Thank God for this sweet book that heals the broken heart. It says it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes, go deeper in the Bible. Oh, what a sweet book it is when you've lost a loved one. Oh, there's nothing, friends and loved ones and all the well wishes and all the flowers and cards, nothing can mean what this book means when old enemy death comes and takes the most precious one in the world away from us. But this book has something to say. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Oh, listen, thank God we have hope this morning. That's what the Bible says. For the Lord himself shall come from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Go deeper in the Bible. Oh, you know, David, David in his wanderings came to King Achish, the Philistine king. And David said, I don't even have a sword. My life's being pursued. And I don't have a sword. And uh, he said to Achish, is there a sword here? And the heathen king said, yeah, there's a sword here. He said, there's a sword of Goliath that you took when you cut his head off. He said, give it me. That's a good one. That's the way I feel this morning. This is the sword of the Spirit. Give it me. That's the only one. Go deeper in the Bible. Oh, I feel sorry for folks mix up about the Bible. I even feel sorry for people who associate with people who mixed up about the Bible. I feel sorry for people that pay people to teach who have mixed up about the Bible. I feel sorry for people that get too friendly with people who are mixed up about the Bible. God's holy book. Old Dr. Bob Jones said, when I was a young man in a little preacher boy's class at that time, 1935, said, when you're grown, when you're my age, you'll be in a battle about the Bible. How true. Uh, it, it doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. I like it. I like every word in it. Sometime I'm going to preach on the word and. I have no idea what I'll say, but I'm going to just take a conjunction. How the Bible is used thousands of times. Show the Bible is a continuous story. I'm going to preach on and. If you have any ideas, give them to me because I'm, I'm starting from scratch. In fact, below scratch. Oh, I like the Bible. I like the Bible. I love people that stand with the Bible. I love people that say, the Bible says it. That settles it, like the preacher said last night. Don't dilly-dally around about it. Don't give somebody some money. To, for a seminary, and no matter if there's some good people around, don't give somebody some money for seminary where they make fun of this Bible and the inspiration of the Word of God. Don't do that. That's wicked. You're having a part in the deterioration of the faith of people in the book of God. 
I didn't mean to say that, but I'm sure enjoyed hearing myself say it. We need to go deeper in the knowledge of Christ. And oh, I know I'm, my, my time is about up. But you know, you say, preacher, I know the Lord. I know you do. I know him too. You say, I know the Lord. But you know, Job said, acquaint thyself with him. Acquaint thyself with him and be at peace. And thereby much good shall come to thee. I like that. The better acquainted you get with Jesus, the more good's going to come to your life. We need to know Jesus better. Uh, we need to go deeper in our knowledge of Christ. I read of four groups in the Bible. I, there are more groups, but you take in the New Testament, one day there's a group of 70, and the Lord divided them up into 30, 35 couples and sent them out, and they went out, and they had what they thought was great victory. They came back, and they said to Jesus, you know the devils were even subject unto us. We said to the demons to jump, and boy, they jumped, and oh, they're jumping up and down and happy. But Jesus soberly said to them, Rejoice not that demons are subject unto you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here were 70 people that the Lord blessed and sent them out on campaigns and to evangelize and to preach, but they didn't understand that the greatest thing in the world is to have your name written up there. Yeah. Nothing greater than that. Thank God it'll never be rubbed out either. Yeah. There's no eraser on God's record-keeping pencil. Shall never perish. Never perish. Has everlasting life. Shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Thank God for that. Oh, yes. We need to go deeper in the knowledge of Christ. I'd like, I, I think of the 12, and I'm trying to leave something out, and I'm the poorest guy in the world when it comes to leaving something out. I usually mess up the whole thing when I try to leave something out. But you take the 12, one of them never knew him. He never knew him. You, you, you say, well, you believe that somebody's made a profession of faith and baptized and a church member could still be lost? Sure, thousands of them are. Here's a man slept with Jesus and the disciples under the stars at night, saw him break bread and saw him heal the sick and raise the dead and make the cripple to walk and yet never knew him as a son of God. Oh, be sure this morning that you're like the Ethiopian eunuch when he said, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Uh, Philip said unto him, if thou believest that Jesus is the Son of God, thou mayest. He said, I believe. And Philip said, woe mew. And down in the water they went. Oh, listen, we need to know him. Three, uh, three of them seemed to know him a little better. Peter, James, and John took him away to raise the girl from the dead. Uh, took them on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, took them a little deeper in the garden but they didn't go deep enough. And he finally looked at all of them and said, what could you not watch me with, with me one hour? I know what you were thinking. You're thinking, oh, if I could have been there that night. If I could have heard him pray, not my will, but thine be done. If I could have heard the drip, drip of the blood from ever pour in his body, I could have heard him groan and travail, say, Oh, Father, let this cup pass from me. I'd have gone with him all the way. No, you wouldn't. You're just as human as they were. There were three of them seemed to love him the most, but they failed him. I think of one. I like this little lady. When Jesus came to her home, she sat at his feet, hung to every word. And Jesus said, She hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. We need to know the Lord. I mean, get acquainted with Jesus Christ. I know him as a savior. I want to know him as a shepherd. I want to know him as the one who leads and guides me into the pastures where he would have me to go. I want to know him as a sanctifier and as a friend. And thank God as an advocate, my daysman at the throne, my go-between between me and the Holy Father. I want to know him as my coming king. When, thank God, 
He's coming someday on a white horse. I've already got my cowboy boots. I'm not a cowboy. I don't, I don't like boots. Can't walk in them. Hurt my feet, but I got a pair. And just in case, I'm going to need them when the king comes. I got a big, wide-brimmed hat just in case. I've got everything but the horse, and I'd have him, but I don't have nowhere to put him right now. But I'll have one when the time comes. Oh, yes, we need to know him as a priest and a companion. Go deeper in the knowledge of Christ. And I'm going to stop right there on that subject. I believe we need to go deeper in soul winning. Somebody says, I know you're going to get on that. You better believe it. And you know why? Because a lot of people are getting off of it. If you want to know what to get on, just look around and see what people are getting off of. A lot of people are trying to mess it all up. Like the preacher says last night, I, I get so sick of hearing people saying, uh, not the preacher last night, but I'm talking about other preachers. I get so sick of, of preachers saying, and nobody can say it like a theologian. Uh, preachers, I mean, independent Baptist preachers can't say it like a theologian. Theologian says it. Brethren, we're in the last days. <laughs> Fooey. Hogwash. I don't know what hogwash is, but it's a good word. <laughs> uh, there's no excuse. You know what the devil's trying to do? He's trying to give people an excuse for not winning souls, building churches, doing it like they used to do it. I was reading this morning, ask for the old path. I don't change very easily. And neither should you until God changes the Bible and changes the gospel and changes the new birth. Then you can change. A lot of folks are saying, well, you're in the wrong place. No, there is no wrong place. You're talking to the wrong person. You can't do that. No way. You can concentrate on it. Try all you want to. The Bible says every creature, you can't go wrong. Say, well, I've had people come back in the Emmanuel Baptist Church I've had them come back to me and hand me a card, and they almost mad enough to fight. Why, you said it, you gave me a card, said Mr. and Mrs. Harris, and uh, I went there, and I said, are you Mr. Harris? He said, no, my name's Mr. Bennett, and you sent me to the wrong house. You can't do that. You can't go to the wrong house. Because the Bible said every house. Now, if I'm going too fast for you, just lift your hand. I'll slow down so you can understand it. You can't go wrong. You know, the Lord's convicted me recently about, we get a lot of calls. Everybody does. You do. And uh, they'll ask for somebody who's not there. Say, is, uh, is uh, Clementine there? I, I always used to say, well, there's no Clementine lives here. They'll call and say, let me speak to Roscoe. No Roscoe here. You know what? That's not the way to do it. When they say, oh, I have the wrong number, I say, no, you don't. You have the number of a Christian child of God going to heaven and knows how to tell you how to be saved. I'm going to tell you God wants us to go deeper in soul winning. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, that's what Jesus said to Peter when he couldn't catch any fish. He said, cast your nets out in the deep, and he caught so many, he didn't know what to do with them. And if you think you've arrived at the point where you're doing all you can do to get people saved and get people baptized and get people discipled, that's when you ought to say, what God wants me to do is to wade out deeper. And a lot of folks are hunting the shallow waters. And a lot of churches are crying and saying, you can't do it because... God, get sick of that kind of talk. We need to go deeper in soul winning. I was preaching in a church not long ago. I really didn't know whether I should go or not. Um, well, it's going to be hard to explain, so it won't take a lot of time. It wasn't a Baptist church. It wasn't a church where I'd ever preached before. And, and um, it wasn't a modernistic church, but it was one of these smooth, suave, sophisticated kind of situations. I kind of wondered whether I ever go, ought to go or not, because I'm not all that suave and smooth. I slobber when I preach and spit, sometimes get strangled. I've nearly thrown up a few times while I was preaching. I didn't know whether I ought to go or not. 
But I went on anyway, and, and um, a man got up and sang a beautiful song, beautiful song. And his name was Smith, very unusual name. His name was Smith. Mr. Smith sang, and my, bless my heart. I said, this must be the right place. After a while, the preacher said, now I want Mrs. Smith to come, and we're going into a Bible memorization campaign, he said, and I want Mrs. Smith to come and uh, explain to you about it because she's been through so many of them with us. So Mrs. Smith, Mr. Smith's wife who just sang, came up, she had her Bible, and she began to talk about memorizing the Word of God. Now, I was sitting over here at the side, and I couldn't hear every word uh, that, uh, that she was saying. I went to the doctor a few months ago, and I think what he said, and I'm not really sure, because I couldn't understand him. I think he said you've lost 30% of your hearing. He might have said you only have 30% of it left. I just really don't know because I couldn't hear the doctor. So I was sitting over there, and I didn't hear it too well. But all of a sudden, I saw a little hanky come up to her face. And I saw the tears begin to drip on her Bible. And she turned and looked toward me for a moment, and I heard her say, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And she went on, and she wept for a while. She got composure, and then she continued. And when it's over, I went down where she and her husband were. And I said, enjoyed your great testimony. And listen, by the way, I enjoy seeing people weep. You know, a lot of Christians think it'd ruin them if they shed a few tears. It won't hurt you. It'll wash some of that old sin and pride out of you. you know, some folks think it's weakness to weep. Jesus wasn't weak, and he wept. But anyway, she was weeping, and I went down. I wanted to hear the whole story, so I went down, and I, I said, you know, I enjoyed your testimony. Didn't, I wasn't able to hear it all. She said, well, the part I think you're talking about she said, I used to work with a girl uh, named Judy Jones. I said, yeah, her name's Judy Davis now. She's from Emmanuel Baptist Church, she said. I said, yes, she's Mrs. Davis now. I used to work with her as a young lady in, in an office, and uh, Judy used to keep saying to me, you know, God loves you. Jesus died for you. You can be saved. And one day, Judy said, you know, you need to go to my church with me this Sunday and to hear my preacher, and she said, I went to Emmanuel Baptist Church that morning, and she said, I'd never been in an atmosphere like that. Said, God got a hold of my heart, and the Lord saved me. She said, I was just mentioning Judy Jones, and thanking God for Judy Jones, and thanking God that she urged me, and she put pressure on me, and I went to Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I was saved. I heard it then, understood it. And I said, thank God for the Judy Joneses that have been in Emmanuel Baptist Church over these years. I want to tell you, God wants you to be a soul winner. God wants you to get people saved. Let me, let me quickly close. I believe we need to go deeper in prayer. I'm not going to take the time. I'd like to because my time is up. But you know, prayer is a power getter. Prayer is a victory giver. It's a holiness promoter, a dispute adjuster. It's an obstacle remover. It's a sin. It's a sin killer. It's a heart warmer. It's a soul cleaner. It's a Christ revealer. I had all this written down here. <laughs> you, you can't beat prayer. Prayer is the most wonderful thing in the world. I read about a man who was an, in an itinerant ministry and had a house full of children in England. And he said, oh, I'm gone so much. Will my children go to hell? I'm gone so much. Will they wind up lost? And said one night he came home uh, from his uh, evangelistic uh, meetings. He came home and he stepped uh, quietly on the porch and looked through the window. And he said there was the wife down on her knees and the children all around her. And he said he got close enough so he could hear her pray. And she prayed, oh God, thank you for our wonderful husband and daddy that loves God and is out preaching. Thank you for him. And Lord, I want all these children to really be saved and know it and wind up in heaven. Watch over this home. Oh, Lord, I pour out my heart to you. God bless this family. And the man, before he went in his house, he said, it'll be all right because there's somebody here knows how to get a hold of God. 
Let me close by saying, I believe that we need to go deeper in the power of God. Years ago, I don't know how many years ago it's been, Dr. A.W. Tozer was alive. Now, Dr. Tozer was not a Baptist then. He's in heaven now, and I'm sure that he is now, but he wasn't then. But he's a deeply spiritual man, and I, I was held in awe by A.W. Tozer. Didn't believe exactly as he did, but I could just see holiness and godliness in him. And I was preaching at Winona Lake Seminary uh, for a week or for five days, and Dr. A.W. Tozer was the other speaker, and I just held him in awe and revered him so much. He's such a godly man. I woke one morning in a little place where we ate breakfast, and he was sitting there alone. I walked over, and I had a red Bible, not this one, but another one. I had a red Bible in my hand. And I walked over, and I said, Brother Tozer, could I have breakfast with you this morning? Would you mind if I sat with you? And this is exactly what he said to me. This is the kind of man he was. He said, I'm not a great socializer. He said, I'd be glad to have you sit with me. I sat down with him and I asked him a question. I said to him, Brother Tozer, how can I have the power of God in my life? And the old man began to talk. And he said, you must first have a broken will. And I wrote it down in that other red Bible. He said, remember Jesus prayed three times, not my will, but thine be done. Your will's got to be broken. Listen, you better know the will of God for your life. I'm not talking just to preachers and missionaries. I'm talking to housewives. I'm talking to what we sometimes call laymen. God has a will for everybody. You, you better find out, uh, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, the Bible says. He said, you must, uh, you must have a broken will. He said, you must have a clean heart. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked may, way in me. Lead me in the light, ever, way everlasting. I wrote it down. said, you have to have a clean heart. He said, you have to be an empty vessel. And he quoted Ephesians 5, 17 and 18. Be not drunk with wine, 8, 18th verse, uh, but be ye filled with spirit. Don't be filled with things that have to do with the flesh. But be ye filled with the Spirit of God. He said you have to have the fullness of the Spirit of God to have power. I wrote it down. He said to me, you have to have a clear vision of Christ. I wrote it down, but I didn't know what he was talking about. He went on to explain. He said, you remember when Stephen died, they stoned him to death. That Spirit-filled man with the power of God upon him preaching the truth and preaching the very scriptures that his audience claimed to believe, and they stoned him and killed him. Jesus. Stephen lifted up his eyes and said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Stephen didn't see who threw the stones because he had a clear vision of Christ. He didn't know when the next one was coming because he had a clear vision of Christ. Well, listen, we need that today. We need to get our eyes on the Son of God I like we've never had them before. I wrote it down. He said to me, you need to live a crucified life. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Do you know what it means to be a crucified Christian? Two, me, two young men in a Bible class one time said to the professor, you know, we don't understand this thing of being dead uh, in Christ and uh, uh, dead to the things of the world and the crucified life. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do said, I, my friend and your friend has just passed away and been buried. I want you to go out to his grave, and I want you to say all the mean things you can say about him and say them right at his grave and say every, every fault and every failing that you've ever known in him. Say it all to him and then come back. And they came back, and he said, did you do it? And they said, yes, we did. He said, what did he say? He said, he didn't say anything. He said, all right, I want you to go back. 
I want you to brag on him. I want to tell him how wonderful he is, how great he was, and what a wonderful person, everything good about him you could say. And you know, that's just as dangerous if you believe them as it is the mean things. But they did it, and they came back, and he said, what did he say? And he said, they said, didn't say a word. He says, that's what it means to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. And old Dr. Tozier said, you have to have a crucified life. Uh, late at night, uh, just a few weeks ago, my phone rang. A lady, my wife said, there's a lady who wants to talk to you. And uh, I went to the phone, and the lady said, Preacher, you called from another state? She said, I want to ask you, where has the power gone? I said, no, I'm not sure now just exactly what you're asking. She said, I'm asking, where has the power gone? I said, my husband's a preacher. I said, my husband preaches. Nobody's ever saved. No heart's ever broken. Nobody ever weeps. Nobody goes to the baptistry. Nobody comes to the altar. She said, where has the power gone? And I'll tell you all that I said to her, but I say to you, we need to have the power of God in our lives. We need to go deeper. Say, well, I believe, I believe God's hand is upon me. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God every day. For this day, we need the filling of the Spirit of God and His power. Someone wrote, a Spirit-filled child of God does not look around, for he would be dismayed. He does not look within, for he would be uh, disgusted. He does not look back, for he would be defeated. He does not look at others, for he would uh, be disappointed. He doesn't look at his circumstances, for he'd be disheartened. He doesn't even look too long at his blessings, for he would be distracted. But he looks at Christ. And then he'll be delighted. 